morning, everybody. Good morning. It's an exciting day. I'm really excited about our academic rodeo. I'm not a math or science fan, but I'm really glad that we're doing this for these kids because I love that they're loving education and that we get to be a part of that. So I'm really excited. I don't understand the idea of loving math, but let me tell you, it's important. It keeps the world going. So I really appreciate the fact that we do this every year. I appreciate the fact that there are a lot of people who worked really hard to get it going. And I know it'll be great to have hundreds and hundreds of kids coming through here uh, and getting to be a part of our congregation for a, a short amount of time. And I'm really excited for our uh, upcoming booth that we're going to share with the other churches in the area. I'm excited that we're saying we are the Lord's church. We're together. We're one. We're unified. I think that's an important message to send to our community. Uh, w when we're in heaven, there's not going to be a division of congregations. There's going to be one body. And there is today only one body of Christ. And I'm so grateful for all the community leaders and the the ministers and the elders and, and those who have participated in these meetings. I think it's really important that we come together as one body uh, in Mount Pleasant and say, this is who we are. So I'm excited about that. Even if you're not able to sign up, I hope you're, you're able to come by and encourage the people at, the, the, at our booth that we're going to have at the fair and to be able to just spread the, the God's word uh, throughout our community this week. If there is anything that we do every day in life, it's waiting for something. I always have to ask myself how, how long I'm willing to wait to eat food when we go out to a restaurant. Is 15 to 20 minutes, well, maybe if it's really good, 30 to 40 minutes, I don't know, an hour, that's really pushing it. But at, on average, they've done a lot of studies and they decide, we spend about five years on average of our lives just waiting. That, that includes waiting for the light to change, waiting at the supermarket, waiting at the DMV, waiting for all sorts of things. You know, that one person in your family that takes longer than everybody else to get ready, that kind of waiting. We all, and are, if you're thinking about or looking at that person, shame on you, you know, no good. But... We, we all wait, and we know it's a part of life, but sometimes we really don't like waiting. For me, when it comes to Christmas time, I'm wanting to give a present that I got for somebody before the big day. I just, that's the way I am. I'm like, I can't wait. To just, I got something for you. You're going to love it. Just, just open it now. Just open, don't, you don't have to wait. Just, just open it now. And, and there, there's a, a sense of excitement about things, and sometimes we just don't want to wait for something that we have to do. We don't, we don't want to sit and wait. And that's why some people, when they, they have an operation or they're in the hospital, they want to get out as soon as they can. They hate having to wait to be discharged. It's hard for them to they'd want to go home. They want to be able to be free. And so there's a lot of times when we simply have to wait. There are some things that are absolutely worth waiting on, especially when it comes to salvation. Our common faith in Jesus is the thing we wait for the most. It's the thing that we must wait for the longest. As James chapter 5, starting in verse 7, tells us, he says, and this is right before James is sort of going against this idea of trying to get all the stuff that you want in this life. He says, it's not worth it. It's not worth the effort. You're, you don't want to wait for heaven so you're amassing this wealth on earth. And he said that the people doing it were doing it through ill-gotten gains, things like that. He said, therefore, you be patient, brethren. So he's showing this contrast between getting stuff here in this life and waiting for the Lord. He says, therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. 
My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Finishing out our discussion on the long game, playing the long game in life, I want us to talk about what it means to truly be patient. We have all sorts of sayings, like if you pray for patience, be careful what you ask for, things like that. And we kind of joke it about it and say, I, you know, I don't have enough patience. But really, what does it mean to be patient, especially when it comes to the things that God has promised to us? How does that look and how do we develop it, spiritually speaking? Well, when we play the long game, it means understanding how God works and how his promises work. We start playing the long game of patience when we secure our hearts in the work of God. Now, in this passage of Scripture, he says, See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. That word establish is the idea of, of really gripping on to something and holding on to it, being firmly set in something. He says, I want you to establish, to be firm in your conviction about the things of God, that the coming of the Lord is at hand. Attaching your heart to the coming of God is an essential component to patience. It requires us to be willing to plant, sow, and water, but have no control of the outcome in life. That's the thing about farmers is, and a lot of you have done a lot of farming, you know that you can do all the work, but ultimately the way the crop turns out isn't up to you. It's, it's what's gonna, it is what it is. There could be bad weather. There could be a dry season. There could be all sorts of factors that affect a healthy crop. The farmer waits for the former and latter rain. The farmer doesn't have any decision or choice when it comes to rain. And we got a little rain a while back, and everybody was kind of dancing in the streets. We really needed this, right? But you can't control those things. You can't make a, a crop come up out of the ground. You just have to do the work. And that's the thing about patience in the Lord. We don't control the outcome of our lives. We don't control the outcome of this academic rodeo or our outreach uh, efforts. We only do the work, and then we wait for the results. And, and too often what happens is we're way too concerned with the results in life. We're way too concerned with how things turned out. We have a pancake breakfast for the community, and only four people show up. We go, well, that was an abject failure. We're missing the point that the outcome of things isn't our concern. Sure, we can do things better. Sure, that we can do things that might be more effective. But ultimately, at the end of the day, God is the only one who should be concerned about the outcome of our work. Our job is to do the work. And that's what he's saying here. What James is trying to communicate is, is that we need to be patient till the coming of the Lord. That means we need to be patient with the results of what's happening in our lives because we can't control it. And the more we try to control the results of our lives, the more we forget about the importance of the work or that God knows something we don't. That's the thing about God is that he understands how our work is effective. He understands what he chooses to do with our work. It could be like Jeremiah that he wants us to preach to the world and nobody listens. That's what he told Jeremiah. He said, I want you to preach and no one's going to pay attention to what you have to say. But what was, it, what was important about what Jeremiah said is that God told him, I want you to speak to the people and I want you to tell them. Was it important that Jeremiah said what he said? Absolutely. Did Jeremiah get the results that he wanted? Oh, no. But Jeremiah still did the work. He still got up every morning and he did the labor that didn't seem to have any effect on the people of God. And we get frustrated sometimes because our labor and our work, whether it's at church or at home, doesn't seem to be, be producing the results that we'd like to see. 
When we work and labor as Christians, though, we must never be focused on results. That's in God's hand alone, and we must attach our hearts fully to the work and not to the fruit of that work to find success. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 5. This is Paul trying to help the church in Corinth realize how dumb division really is. I love that we mentioned our connection that we're having with other congregations in town, that, that division is not anything that Jesus wants in his people, in his church. And Paul says this. He says, who then is Paul and who is Apollos? Some were saying, I'm a Paul. Well, well I'm of Apollos. We're better than you. We're the Apollites, you know, or, or something like that. He says, who is Paul, who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, and we know this, right? But God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. And now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Do you see anywhere in this verse where he says, now he who is able to produce greater fruit, he'll be seen as greater. Is that there? Does he say Apollos is greater because he has more baptisms? Or Paul is greater because he has a better track record? No. He says, the ones who work will receive their reward. Now, doesn't that take some pressure off of us as Christians when we don't have to control the results, when we just do the work, when we focus everything on the work of God? Because let me tell you, throughout the Bible, if you pay attention, you, oftentimes the people could not see the results of their labor even generations after they were doing things. That's the way God works because God has a plan and God has a, a, a thought. And we talked about this plan last week. He has a thought that goes beyond ours. He has an understanding that goes beyond ours. But I will tell you this, when we work hard, we're going to see results. When we work hard, we will not come away empty. But don't be discouraged when you don't see immediate results. Don't you know God and the way he works? Do you think God would ever take what we do and make it come to nothing? Why do we get that way? Why do we get so focused on numbers that we can't see the importance of the work? When our hearts are attached to the work, we will see results, but they will be beyond our imagining. God's results will always be greater than our efforts. Imagine having a puzzle piece in your hand, but it's a puzzle piece with a thousand pieces. Is it possible to see what the puzzle is going to look like with that one piece? Well, no. It's just one piece. And you know when you lose that piece, then it will drive you absolutely crazy. Because it doesn't matter if you have the other 999, that one piece missing. It, it ruins the whole puzzle, right? Do you know that you're one piece out of millions? But that one piece is precious to God. That one piece he has invested the blood of Jesus in. That one piece he has cultivated and he has prepared for something special. We're part of a greater puzzle that only God knows the image of. And so we need to focus on making that piece fit into God's plan. Not fitting God's plan into our peace, but saying, God, place me and my work and my labor and my heart and my tears and my life where you need me the most. And then we can be secure in God's work. We can put our heart into the work and let God do the rest. And so patience is trusting that God can do the rest if we do the work. As we exercise patience in working for the Lord, we must be careful that in the waiting we do not be begin to become impatient with each other. We play the long game of patience when we practice perseverance. And, and I say perseverance because he kind of fits two things together. The first thing he says back in our passage of Scripture, and this is a great warning, 
Do not grumble against each other, brethren, unless you be condemned. That is a, if you want to know, is it okay to gripe about each other? No, it's not, ever. That's what James says. He says, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge stands at the door. James is tired of people grumbling about each other. Did you notice that? He's tired of it, so he's saying, you're going to be condemned if you keep grumbling about what other people are doing or are not doing. His message was, you focus on perseverance. And and we know that because right after that, he says this. He says, my brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. He says, look back at the prophets. They didn't complain and grumble. Well, sometimes they did, but God fixed them up when they did. He said they had to suffer and they had to have perseverance. The idea of perseverance, by the way, it, it, the, the, another version might say endurance, but what it means is if you fully describe it, it would be putting out our best effort in spite of the setbacks and suffering we face. Because the first time, time that happens when we try something and forces come up against it is we want to gripe. We want to give up. We want to quit. We want to say it's too hard. It's too much. People didn't show up. People didn't do what they were supposed to do. Things didn't turn out well. We get mad. We throw a hissy fit and we quit and we say, I'm not doing it anymore. Have you you ever been in that position? Have you ever experienced it? You ever been so frustrated with somebody else you just wanted to wring their neck and say, what were you thinking? Please don't wring anyone's necks, by the way. Please don't do that. I'm not encouraging that. But what he's saying is that the prophets understood. You know how frustrated they must have been with the people of God when they preached and they preached and they taught the truth and the masses just ignored them. When they called on help and no one answered. When they worked and labored and it just seemed like nobody cared. And the the thing they could have done is said, I quit. This is too much. What Jeremiah said is, no, there's a fire in my bones. I have to release this. I can't not speak the word. I can't stop. I can't just quit. I can't give up. I don't care if everybody else gives up. I'm not giving up. When you see people in the, in the, in the, like Joshua in the Old Testament who says, uh, you choose who you're going to serve, whether it's the people on the mountain or, or, or whether it's the, this God or that God of Egypt or, or uh, of these false gods in the land of Canaan. But as for me and my house, he says, it doesn't matter who else. For me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. If we're the only ones that get up and do the work and do what God has called us to do, so be it. But I'm not going to turn my back on the will of God. That's perseverance. And that's what the church needs, and that's what God wants from us. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't look at what someone else is doing or not doing. Put your nose to the grindstone and work. That's what God has called you to do. And at the end, don't say, look, God, I did better than everybody else. I persevered when everyone else quit. You say, I am but a lowly servant who has only done what God has called me to do. Because that's people who have joy in their work. People who persevere. People who aren't looking around waiting for someone else to do the work. People who say, today I'm doing what God has called me to do because no one else died for my sins. No one else has given me everything in life that pertains to godliness. I owe my all to my Father in heaven and I cannot give up because someone else discouraged me. That's such an important message. And look, I understand. I've been a minister. I'm a third-generation preacher. I've been to churches where I've seen people who have quit, seen people who have fought, seen people who have split, seen people who have said awful things to my family, to my friends. I have been through the fire before, just as I'm sure you have. 
But that's not what keeps me going. It's not the de determination upon my, my desire to serve. What gets me up in the morning is the fact that God still loves me in spite of all of my faults. That's what makes me persevere. If you look at other people or depend on other people to keep going, you won't make it. It doesn't matter if they're the best people in the world. They're going to let you down. It doesn't matter if they're the hardest workers in the world. They're going to have a bad day. It doesn't matter if everybody else says, it's too much, we can't go on. I'm going to get up and do what God calls me to do because I serve him, not them. I know we serve each other. I get that. But our call is to persevere. Our call is to endure through suffering, through hardships, through disappointments, through trials, through everything. And I know you've gone through a lot. I know you've lost people. I know you've struggled. I know you've been disappointed. I know you've been discouraged. I know that all of us go through those things. But folks, we're still here and we're still persevering. So don't give up. Be patient. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. And because of that, we keep going. As we train ourselves to find endurance in our patience, we persevere when we fix our eyes on our own work and not the work of others. We're told in Romans chapter 14, verse 4, it's a powerful verse. He says, and this is talking about meat offered to idols and and people's proclivity for saying, well, look at this, what this guy's doing, what this lady's doing. They're doing wrong. Let's judge them. Let's look at them and condemn them instead of looking at their own work. And this is what he said here in Romans. He says, Romans 14, 4, Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand. For God is able to make him stand. He says, it's not up to you to look at what another is doing. Sure, we have to be, have discretion. Sure, we have to speak the truth. But ultimately, the call is to look at what I do and say, Lord, am I doing what you've called me to do today? Am I giving my all for you right now? That's the only question that we should answer each day because that's what matters in our relationship with God. We can try hard to get everybody else to do work around us, but ultimately it has to start with us. And when we practice perseverance, we can put up with just about anything. Jesus went all the way to the cross with his perseverance, and we're a long way from being crucified for being good. We can do it. We can persevere. We can make it through illness, through cancer, through suffering, through betrayal, through heartbreak, through loss, we can make it through anything because God is on our side. God is with us so we can persevere. We can endure. We can make it until the end. When we find perseverance, when we accept the hardships that comes with patience and look for the spiritual rewards attached to eternity, instead of the circumstances we find ourselves in, we will understand what patience looks like. Nobody likes waiting in traffic. How many of you enjoy waiting in traffic? That's one reason we moved here. I did not like traffic. I still don't like traffic. I'm not a fan of being in the middle of traffic. Some people love it. I don't understand them. They're weird. I don't like it. But it's necessary for me to be in traffic sometimes to get where I'm going, right? It's a part of it. You deal with it. And there are going to be times in our lives when things get in our way. A wall of this struggle, a wall of deception, a wall of disappointment, whatever it might be. It's part of it. It's part of the struggle. It's part of the journey that we're going to hit a brick wall sometimes. We can't give up when that happens. We have to persevere. We have to keep going and give our best even when things are at their most difficult. And we cannot allow circumstances to be the, the source of our joy and our peace. We need to trust in the living God. Taking with us the worth of fixing our hearts 
are on the work of God and the perseverance we need to endure till the end. What we are being led to is the trust we place in the nature and reliability of God. We find complete patience in the long game when we put our faith in God's character. Do you know why I believe that I'm going to heaven? Why I believe that my sins are forgiven? Why I believe that this church will thrive and grow? Why I believe in all of you? Because I believe in God's character. Because God is the one that I depend on. And he says it here. This is the secret. This really brings it all together. At the end of this passage of Scripture, in James 5, 7 through 11, he says in verse 11, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. I don't think those were two words Job was thinking of when he lost his children, when he lost his livelihood, when he lost his health. I don't know that he was thinking compassionate and merciful when he suffered in silence. And then when his friends started trying to put blame on something, trying to find out something that he had done that had caused all of this harm upon him. But in the end, Job did not curse God. In the end, Job worshipped instead of, of crying and screaming at God. In the end, God proved his mercy and compassion. Not only did he restore everything Job had lost, he gave him even more. And we're not looking at financial blessing. We're not looking at lots and lots of kids and grandkids. We're, we're not talking about that. that. That's kind of the Old Testament stuff. And, and we have something different in the, in the Lord. And even Job had something different than just all the material things. Because it was that God proved that he was faithful to Job. And that Job never should have questioned God's faithfulness to him. That even though he endured a great deal of suffering, God was still with Job. God still loved Job. God still preserved Job because God's character didn't change. He was merciful and gracious from day one and he is still just as merciful and gracious today. And he always will be. You can bank on God's character even when everything else around you is unsure. Even when the times, and some people I've heard, they're afraid of what's going on in the world. They're afraid of what's going on in our country. And we get this way every four years for some reason. I don't know what happens every four years that would cause us this. But we talk about it a lot more at these times, don't we? But I tell you this, God is merciful and compassionate no matter what happens. And because of that, you can be patient through hard times, through impossible times. It is trusting in God's compassion and mercy that gives us the patience required to be faithful till the end. There's a song, Does Jesus Care? Do you all know that song? Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. But it, 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 the... It asks several questions during the verse. Does Jesus care? And he has all of these scenarios. Does he care whenever I'm lonely? Does he care whenever I'm suffering, et cetera, et cetera? And the answer is, of course, yes, I know he cares. And we have to ask that question. Does Jesus care about us? Does he know the things we're going through? Does he understand our heartaches? Does he understand loneliness? Does Jesus understand loss? Does he understand burdens? Does he understand suffering? Of course he does. He understands us more than any of us. He understands it and he is there with us during our worst times. We've lost a lot of people the past few weeks. Have you all noticed that? Three, four funerals. It gets tiring. It, because you just, you don't have enough in you to mourn after a while. Sometimes we feel that way. Sometimes we feel, I just don't know if I have it in me anymore. And, and I look at Jesus and his life, and there are chapters that just break my heart 
whenever he's trying so hard to deliver the message of the gospel and people just don't care. They have no compassion. They have no interest. They're abandoning him and he feels so alone because he's the only one that truly understood his mission and his purpose. He's the only one that that truly was and is God And, and he was surrounded by men who had wicked, evil hearts. Even his apostles just didn't get it and one of them what was going to betray him and did betray him. How did he do it? He trusted in his father because he knew his father. He says, I know the father. And if you want to come to the father, you're going to have to come through me because I know, I understand. I want you to be patient because in the end, I'm coming back for you. In the end, I'll be there with you. I'll be there with you holding your hand on your last day. I'll be there with you when you awake in eternity. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Do you know how much we need to be reminded of this? Because God wants us to be patient and wait on him. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. Why? Because when we wait on the Lord, his character proves that he will come through in the end. We're told in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 through 15. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that he hears us, whatever we ask. And we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. In other words, he's listening. He understands. And he will provide what is needed according to his will. I don't know what you see for the future in your life. I don't know what you see for today or for tomorrow. I don't know what you think about the future of our country or this church. But this is my encouragement to you. Be patient until the coming of the Lord. God is in his heaven. He will not change, nor can the world change him, nor can sin change him, nor can loss change him, nor can brokenness change him. He is still the same God and he will be there for you if you call upon his name. He will help you. He will strengthen you. He will empower you and he will save you. He is mighty to save. At our worst hour, God remains the same. I want to encourage you who have not been baptized into Christ to consider this, that being joined with Christ means that God will produce fruit in your life. He will give you eternal life. He will forgive your sins. He will put his spirit into you. He will always strengthen and support you. So if you haven't given that decision more thought, please do today. And church, if we're running out of patience, turn to God, turn to his promises, turn to his character, turn to perseverance, turn to the work that God's given us to do and let us with all of our hearts trust in the living God. We're playing the long game, but in the end, God will provide. Won't you come to him now with any need you have as together we stand and sing. Had it not been the Lord who was on our side.